السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. إن شاء الله I will commence with a short recitation of the Quran for purposes of baraka and that's the usual way that I'd like to start off. What it does for me is it gets me into the right mode. إن شاء الله. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون ولا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم أولئك هم الفاسقون لا يستوي أصحاب النار وأصحاب الجنة أصحاب الجنة هم الفائزون لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه وبعد All praise is due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم We ask the Almighty to bless him and all his companions To bless all those who have struggled and strived To bring the deen to us and to bless every single one of us to grant us goodness My beloved brothers and sisters this evening we will be speaking about Islam's solutions to the fragmented family. We can start off with a broken home or we can start off with a home that gets on very well, like they say, a house on fire. Why they say a house on fire? Only Allah knows. Fire is destructive, to be honest with you. After some time, it starts cracking and breaking. So for that reason, we need to know we can either start here or there. I would prefer to start from a home that is actually getting along so that we can avoid the fragmentation, inshallah. That having been said, we can also commence either from how the parents bring up their children because that is one of the first points or we can commence with how we choose our spouses. Looking at the gathering here, they seem to be quite a lot of married people. You know, they say you can tell a married man when he just looks at you like he's full of worry, you know? <laughs> Allahu Akbar. So looking at the crowd, we see, mashallah, I don't think we are worried, but at the same time, there is a concern. <laughs> I think it's easy for us to commence with how we should be bringing up our children. And I won't take much time with that because that should be discussed on a or in a lecture of its own 
But if we have given our children the correct upbringing, and one of the best ways of bringing up our children is through leading by example. If we would like our children to be honest, we need to be honest. If we would like our children to dress appropriately, we need to dress appropriately. If we have given in to the issues, to the negativities of our age, they will give in to the negativities of their age. And we know the Arabic saying, Ma'rufu zamanina munkaru zamanin qad mada. That which we consider okay today used to be considered taboo a long time ago. Can you think of your grandmother in jeans? Allahu Akbar. <laughs> it's a question and it's a reality. But today jeans is nothing to a lot of people. Obviously, you know what? It's part of clothing. And today, someone walking around in a swimsuit in the middle of KL is considered taboo. There may come a time Allah protect us. But in some capitals, it's already started. It's already started. And then the children will say, but it's my right, it's my human right. God created me. Come on, this flesh is from God. Why should I be covering it? Allahu Akbar. People are talking that way. May Allah safeguard us. So if we have given in and caved in to what is considered taboo in our times, we need to worry about our children. They will surpass that. They will go beyond that. They may then give in or cave in to that which is considered taboo at that particular time, which will be far worse than what we have con been considering taboo all along. So for that reason, I say it's very important to instill values amongst your children. Most of us think life is here to enjoy and have fun and, you know, see everything nice and, you know, do everything as you want, eat what you like, go where you like, party every day. And I've been repeating this because it's a fact. This is what a lot of people think that I need to enjoy and enjoy not realizing Allah has created you in a specific way. <laughs> Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, I am placing on the earth a Khalifa. The meaning of the term Khalifa, some people say Viceroy. Some people have used different terms. Some say Ambassador. I would like to tell you that Khalifa includes those who will come one after the other, who will be succeeded and who will be successors. Khalifa, that which keeps on coming. So you are there, after a time your children will be there, you will be gone, then they will be gone, and their children will be there, then they will become parents, and they will have children, and so on. So we need to realize that I don't have much time in this world, not much time. So in that short time, let me prepare the future generation. And let me lead by example. And let me continue in life in such a way that when I am gone, those who have left behind, those whom I have left behind will remember me for the goodness that I have brought forth and not for the evil. I always say the way we handle ourselves in lives, especially, you know, within marriage, you find people making life tough for their daughters-in-law and, you know, mothers-in-law and so on. And life, there is just, you know, some form of animosity for some reason in some homes, such that when the person dies, instead of rest in peace, rest in peace or something, they would probably flick the sweat off their foreheads and say, whew, they should have died a long time ago. <laughs> is that the type of... Relation we would like to have with people who are saying, when is this man going to die? When is he going to die? As they say in the English language, you know, one leg in the grave, the other one on a banana skin. Which means you're about to drop straight there. And yet we are engaged in all sorts of misbehavior. May Allah grant us the opening, the understanding. We can succeed in this world, but we will only achieve true success if we have left behind a legacy that will be fit to take from us. And this is a Muslim home. In Islam, a successful mother or father is the one who has nurtured the children in a beautiful way, leading by example. And there is one more point I want to raise before I go to how to choose a spouse. And that is, in the same way that we would be so careful as to the upbringing within the home, even if it is 100% perfect, Say, for example, there is no, nothing bad that happens in your home. You are happy with the manners of your child and grow up and so on. The external environment plays a bigger role in shaping the child nowadays than the internal environment. What you say to your child can be, yes, okay, mom, okay, dad, yes, dad, oh, wow, you know, it's okay. You have the, the, the rare cases of the women who might be in hijab, you know, in the home, and the mom says, wow. And as soon as dad drops them off at varsity, everything is gone. 
And then, Dad, don't come now. It's still there's 10 minutes, Dad. Just park your car outside. Why? Because I quickly need to dress back how Dad dropped me. He must pick me. What happened between when Dad dropped me and picked me? Only Allah knows. And sorry, your schoolmates know as well. <laughs> that is hypocrisy. So, in order to solve that, we need to know Islam tells us to guide our children as to the type of friends they should be having with responsibility. Sometimes we're too busy at work. Oh, Dad, you know what? The dad says to his child, well, look, I work and I sweat to earn the money to send you to the university or I work and I earn the money to do this for you and to send you to the best of the schools. But dad, you don't even spend one minute with me through the day because you don't even have time for mom. Where are you going to have time for us? We're guilty of that. You know, a typical father, very busy man, comes home. He doesn't even greet properly. I hope this is not the case in KL. Remember, I'm fortunate that it's my first visit, so I cannot pinpoint to say this is a problem here. But I can tell you that it's a problem elsewhere, where typical dad comes back home and, you know, he uh, puts his bag. That's if he has one. Nowadays, you just need a phone to move around with. And he puts it aside. And what happens, he will uh, sit in front of the television and flick. The flicking is a male habit, if you know that. You flick. The news is there. You're not satisfied with it. You flick again, you know. Is it because there was no female, you know, saying the news or is it because you really are interested in the news? It happens sometimes. These type of things, the, the flicking, flicking, and they're asking you, would you like to eat? Oh, dad, welcome home and so on. And you're just looking at the screen. You know, we would have loved it if there were little cameras where we could appear on the screen to attract dad's attention. Hello, dad. But this is a home. Is that a Muslim home? If we are not going to be fragmented as a result, what do we expect? So a Muslim will not do that. You need to realize your responsibility. You went to work. I normally tell people to spend or to have one meal, one meal with your children a day is worth more than 10,000 US dollars. And that is a very minimum figure. Because you're, you can sit not only table manners, but at the same time, talk, speak, let them open up. How was your day? Oh, and do not blast a child when they come up with some negativity, but teach them. Because if the child says, Dad, today I met a few people, you know what? They're gay. I don't know why I'm raising this issue every time. But anyway, it's a problem of, of the age. And you say, what? You get up from your seat. You dare see those people again. Okay, okay, okay. That okay was connected to your temper, not connected to the brain. Have you, so, have you understood that? So do not treat your children that way. You engage them in discussion. Sometimes we don't have the time to engage our children in discussion, but we've got the time to think up how to expand our business. What's the point of a successful businessman? And yet his house is totally out of order. It would have been good if we had little tags for a little while saying, you know, like when you have a lift, they have a tag saying out of order. The next day it starts working. If families were like that, it would have been okay. Put a tag for a few days saying out of order, we're fixing it. But it does not work that way. You need to maintain it constantly. Constantly it needs to operate. And you need to understand when someone comes up with something within the home, talk to them, find out how it happened. Perhaps the school you sent them to was wrong. Perhaps the environment you, you allowed them to dive into, you did not advise them before they went into the ocean to say, you know what, you were a big fish in this little pond. Now you are going to go into the ocean. You are just one of the little fish in that big ocean. Be careful that a whale doesn't come. Or you might be living in the belly of the whale thinking you are in another pool here. It can happen. So we need to guide our children, talk to them. The point I've raised, I'm sure you've picked it up, is that when your child comes up with something negative in order to maintain the home and protect it from defragmenting or fragmenting you need to communicate with the child engage the child in a beautiful discussion spend the time when you hear that type of statement from your child it will tell you i need to have two meals now with my children not just one i need to sit with them on a saturday a sunday i need to go as a family to the masjid I need to go with my children to a place where we can listen to someone speak to us as a family. Then we can come back and discuss. You know, this was said, what do you think of that? This was said, what do you think of that? They also have a mind. For all I care, their mind is made up of the mind of yourself and your spouse. And don't only blame the half that was from the spouse when things go wrong. Some people do do that. When they have a bad habit, they say, that's from his mother. 
And the mother says, when they have a bad habit, that he's taken that from his father. Don't blame. It's the responsibility. We both are responsible. So to spend the time of the day, each day, or as often as possible, if your work entails that you travel a lot, you need to balance it by when you are around, you spend much more time with them. They must miss you. They must respect you. They listen to you. We spoke about being a role model of your own children, meaning leading by example. If your child has a role model in the house, do you know how beneficial that is? They are watching you 24 seven. Whereas when they have a role model outside the house, they only see them once in a while. So if they are watching you 24 seven and you are the role model, they know how to wake up. They know how to eat. They know how to drink. They know how to dress. They know absolutely everything. They've watched it from you. But if there's a role model outside, they may know how to give a public lecture. Why I say this is because I had a little child who came up to me imitating me. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I said, whoa, you see, you are the role model. I said, well, what does he know in my mind? I didn't say it actually. What does he know besides the salam and a few statements? And those statements themselves, the parents who understand them have not yet taken heed. And they are so proud of the child repeating something. Yes, it's good. It's a good sign. May Allah grant our children intellect. But a true role model is he who is watched 24 7. Mom, mashallah, you answer the phone. And you know, there are some typical problems we face sometimes. And you have statements that are uttered that are not befitting a mother in the home. And the children are listening to it. They actually go one higher with even worse statements. Allah protect us. And you have, you know, the flirting habits. Sometimes adults flirt. And in the presence of their children, to the degree that it becomes embarrassing. When I say flirting, I mean, it becomes obvious to your children that this person, you know, mom blushes with her blackberry, but doesn't blush with dad. Allahu Akbar. Imagine a blackberry making you blush. Allah, it's, I'm talking reality here. And now, you punching in how many I love yous on there, but you haven't said it once to your husband. And then a woman will say, well, I don't love him. What should I do? It is a difficulty. You need to utter these statements. When your children see that the two of you love each other properly and the two of you love each other with respect, it automatically enhances their confidence. It makes them children who are much more confident and they know they have the love, they have the care of the parents. So therefore in Islam, we are taught that when you have a problem, do not resolve it in the presence of your young children. Don't involve them in it, especially at that age. They don't need it. And this is something we need to correct. A lot of people, mom and dad are screaming and yelling and swearing and the children are just looking. They might go to their room, lock it and start crying. That is from a psychological point of view, very understandable. And they don't know. Then the home, the, the family breaks. And this is why in Islam, when a family, when there is a difficulty, there is a method of solving the problem and inshallah we will get to that in a few moments but there are difficulties that we are facing and the quran has the solutions as i whatever i am saying this evening is taken from the quran and the sunnah and the islamic teachings do you know that when we have to choose a spouse and i'm getting to that now when we have to choose a spouse you know there are people smiling at me here and i know why they say why weren't you here 20 years ago okay it's fine <laughs> If you've already done it, it's okay, we can rectify. But we have to talk to those. We have to talk to those who have not yet uh, chosen the spouse. And even if you have, try and go back and see the qualities that you have looked at and develop on them, develop them. When you choose a spouse, the hadith says there are several things that people look at. Al-mal, some people look at wealth. Al-jamal, some people look at beauty. Al-hasab, some people look at the status of the person. And some people look at the nasab, which is the lineage of the person. And some people look at the deen and the religion of the person. So many people don't understand this narration. When the narration says, The hadith says, Become successful by selecting the one with religion, with character and conduct coupled with deen. One narration, the Prophet ﷺ says, when a proposal comes from someone whom you are satisfied with their level of character and conduct, or in fact, starting with the level of deen and character, then allow them to get married. 
allow them to marry. You're looking at two things, character and deen, which means if the character is great and good or equivalent to yours slightly higher and the deen level is equivalent to yours slightly higher, then you stand a better chance for your daughter to be in a home where she will be happy. Get them married. So why is it that when it comes to wealth and looks and so on, some people think that in Islam, you don't look at looks. You know, you don't look at looks. As it is, the women are supposed to be covered. So you don't look at looks. That's wrong. The hadith didn't say, do not look at looks. The hadith is saying, you see all the points you want to see, but give the tip of the scale to the deen. Which means if you have someone who's drop dead gorgeous, and they don't have any deen in them, and then you have someone who hasn't yet you know, killed you. You know what drop dead means you die. <laughs> they haven't yet killed you with their looks, but mashallah, they can, I don't know if you can say drop unconscious gorgeous. <laughs> if that's a statement which is slightly lesser than the DD, you know. So if someone comes and they are good looking, okay, they have a better deen in them. It is better for you to compromise the looks to a certain extent and make sure that the religion is intact than to go only for looks because the plan of Allah is there will come a stage when that blemishless face will develop wrinkles. If you have loved the outward face, you will not be able to get along with that woman. Because if you have loved the interior, it only blossoms as time passes. With the wrinkles of the face, the wrinkles of the heart disappear. Have you ever thought of that? With the wrinkles of the face, the wrinkles of the heart disappear because now when a person becomes old and aging, they develop a link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They become better. They are worried about their death and the, the generations to follow and their children and now their grandchildren. You now need to guide your sons and daughters how to get married. So we are looking for someone who is reasonably reasonable looking, someone who has a good voice. I made mention of that the other day or was it yesterday when we did say that, you know, it's important to marry someone who, who has a voice that you are at least, you know, attracted to. You cannot marry a person whom you don't like their voice at all. It's not like they are bad. Someone else will come along who will like that voice. You know, this is why we tell everyone, sometimes in, in the Muslim home, we are suffering because people, and let's talk about some of the women folk and what the, the norm is because of television and the bombardment, you have a certain shape that is acceptable and a certain shape that the, the media has made you believe is unacceptable. I have come across men who have told me I prefer big woman. I'm just letting you know the reason why I'm saying this is because no matter what size you are, someone somewhere will definitely feel attracted to that. Allah has created us differently. So don't think for a moment, you know what, I am not really so good looking. Why? Yes, we should be healthy. We should be concerned, but not to the point of depression. Not at all. Because then the home goes. You know, how does the home fragment in that? You find women prohibiting themselves from food. And after a while, they come to the sheikh. Sheikh, I think my daughter has a jinn. Why? You know, she sees things. She sees things. What does she see? like stars, like different things, you know, and they're not there, you know, I think there's a jinn. So people have come to me saying this, and we look at them completely anorexic, completely out of food and everything. You say, you know what, the jinn do not like dairy products. <laughs> so the minute you have some dairy products, your jinn will begin to disappear because that is, you know, it's like opposite poles. And the jinn doesn't like red meat, you know, in certain proportions, and so on. And you find, Wallahi, I have had cases where they then tell you after that, that Alhamdulillah, the jinn is gone. <laughs> that was just malnourishment. You couldn't, you had to, you were dizzy whilst you were walking and all that because you didn't eat and you didn't eat because you worried about how slim you should be. You know, today if a woman is more than 45 kgs, whoa, it's a problem. Why? Inshallah, you can go up or down, whatever it is for as long as you are healthy. You can eat it and burn it. And this is why a better way than to abstain from food is to have it and burn it out. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautify our women for our men. And I'm not talking about all the men, but I'm talking about the husbands, inshallah. 
And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us good homes. And may Allah beautify the men as well, inshallah. And the beauty of a man is more in his character and conduct than anything else. Believe me, if you have a man who's mediocre looking and his character is brilliant, he attracts much more than a person whose character stinks. Sorry to use that word. A character stinks and he might be, you know, a, a, a very, very muscular, handsome man, you know. And the people will say, no, 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 be careful. This guy's only got swear words from his mouth. And sometimes what happens is a few moments later or a few days or months later, people realize this man is not what the outward appearance says he is. The same applies. So this goes back to our point. When we are choosing, we can look at health. Uh, sorry, we can look at wealth. We, we can look at various other things. Just that I mentioned health. Obviously, we know in the Sharia, it's important to be healthy. And if we have health matters that need to be known by the spouse, you need to tell them prior to marriage. You cannot hide something major. If it's just a cough, don't say, look, I don't know if you want to marry me. I've got a cough. You know? <laughs> uh, but if it is something major, then definitely it needs to be said. So we can look at the issue of lineage, the issue of uh, wealth, the issue of status and so on. That is not to be given preference. If those come without the religion, we'd rather stay away. That's what Islam teaches us. Because the success, according to the end of the hadith, the true success is connected to those who have become successful with the deen. And now I want to pause for a minute to tell you a typical scenario. When a person marries someone whom they have seen, not dressed properly, perhaps in a nightclub, perhaps at a party, perhaps, you know, doing something wrong, and that has attracted the man. And the two of them get to talk to each other and they decide after some time, we'd like to get married and they marry. Can I tell you what has happened? And I'm talking reality. Sometimes what happens is, the woman at some stage realizes that I need to develop my spirituality. So she wants to start covering her hair. Perhaps she wants to put on something. The husband says, look, that's not the woman I married. I didn't marry that woman. So the fact that we were not dressed appropriately and we allowed someone to love our outer looks, we become enslaved by that forever. It may block us from developing religiously because the man will keep on saying, look, that's not the woman I married. I married you because of how head and shoulders looked in your hair. <laughs> and I married you because of how the Levi's jeans looked on your legs and so on. So if that's the case now, I want you to dress like that forever. If you don't, I'm going to get another wife. Now you're sitting saying, but can't I get close to Allah? My beloved sister, it was a mistake that was made years back. And I hope those who are not yet married, we can take a lesson. And I hope the brothers who are here, if there are any one of us who might have made that type of choice, allow them to the growth in spirituality. Don't be embarrassed by your wife when she covers up properly. After she hadn't been doing that for long, it will help you and your offspring. Remember, when you sow a seed, then it grows. So you cannot sow a seed of cactus and expect apples to grow. Yes. Mind you, there is a cactus fruit for as long as you, you know, rub off or you scrape off all the little, uh, the, the, the prickly points on it. You might enjoy that cactus fruit. I don't know if you have it here. But who wants to handle that when you can have a proper apple, mashallah. My beloved brothers and sisters, the beauty of Islam is such that from the beginning, whether it is the upbringing of the child or how to select a spouse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laws in place that will help you from the family fragmenting, breaking up. So if we followed the rules from the very beginning, then we will find that the family unit will not break. However, sometimes we have, as you know, cases where we didn't look at that. We might have overlooked it. We might not have been that religious at that time and so on. There are still solutions. You see, we are taught to attend the nikah, to witness the nikah of people. It is a sunnah to have it in the masjid. When we are getting married, it is an act of worship. And it is, in fact, taught by the Prophet, peace be upon him, that as far as possible, try to have the officiation within a masjid. According to one narration, try and have it in the masjid. Because it's the house of Allah. Imagine you say, I'm having my wedding 
uh, I'm having my officiation and I'd like to have it at this hall or that hall. It's okay. It, it's not like it's not going to be valid. But say I want to have it in the house of Allah. The one who made me, now I want to tie the knot in his house. Subhanallah. That is so blessed. Uh, over and above that, we need to know that we are encouraged to attend when other people are getting married. You're encouraged to attend, to be witness. One of the reasons of that, and the ulama have mentioned many reasons, is that you need to ponder over your plight and condition. You are either a person who's married, or you are not married, or you've lost your spouse through divorce or death. You cannot really be any other probability. You're either married or not married, yet, or you've lost your spouse through death or through divorce. So when you sit and you watch this, this groom, a beautiful, you watch them, watch them properly. And the Imam says, have you accepted her as your wife? You find in a lot of cases, especially, you know, the, the innocent ones. When I say the innocent ones, I mean, not those who have now gone out for eight years. And, you know, they probably have had, uh, you know, how can I word it respectfully? They have had relations deeper than what married couples would have had. Then they just want to halalize it eight years later. We don't want that to happen. Islam has made marriage very easy. Islam has made marriage very easy. One of the reasons is, let's not block our children from getting married. Sometimes you have a man who says, no, I want you to finish your studies and so on. It's important to finish your studies. We are not saying no, very important. But don't you want to protect them from the sin that is being committed right now at the varsity when nikah is so easy? You can put in your rules and regulations and there is no harm. You can say, look, if we get a nikah done, you will not live with one another until the age of, until you complete your studies and so on. But the link you have now is halal. I'm only suggesting a solution. And I'm not sure if some of you may find it applicable or not, but we have found it applicable and we have tried to encourage some who have engaged in it and they have not regretted it. May Allah protect our daughters and our sons. Notice I said daughters first because the daughter, subhanallah, we are worried about our daughters more than our sons. The son can, you know, tomorrow he can get up and find a job and do this and do that. And he might even say, dad, I don't want to see you anymore. Out. The daughter needs you. Tomorrow something happens. You are the father. So when we attend the nikah, we are watching these people. We ask ourselves, when I was there so many years back, how excited was I? How excited was I? This is something you need to ask yourself. I was so happy and delighted today. Now, 20 years, 10 years, 5 years, 50 years later. Am I as happy or happier or not as happy? The answer to that will help you rectify the problem. You were so excited. Look at this man. He's excited. You know, it's like... Some people say, well, that's his jail term. He doesn't know when the Imam is saying, have you accepted her? It's like saying, you know, you have been served with life imprisonment. And he's saying, yes. That's not how Islam looks at it. That's not how Islam looks at it. We are to be thinking, I was so happy. Can I tell you how happy they get once I was officiating a nikah? You might have heard this in some of my lectures. And there was a young boy, very excited. He was shaking. And I was wondering whether he's shaking because of what's about to happen or, you know, he's shaking because of the excitement of the moment. I'd like to hope it was the latter. And I told him, have you accepted her as your wife? He says, yeah. I told him, don't say yeah, say yes, I have. He looked at me and he says, yes, you have. I said, not me, <laughs> you. I said, not me, you. Now, this is the excitement. Imagine that's how excited they get. That's how excited I think a lot of us were. I'd like to hope we were. Why is it that today we are not as excited about our marriages that took place so long ago? Because somewhere down the line, we have lost the path. We have deviated. There are some people who are married and perhaps in our midst for 40 years, 50 years, they are as happy as that and even happier. May Allah increase the number of those. Amen. Because they still have the little rose that comes about. They still have. And we are Muslims. We don't wait for Valentine's and Valentine's days. No, no, no. Every day is a day where you express your love. Every day is a day where you show your dedication. Every day is a day when you, when you fulfill the duties of yours and above the duty. You don't just stick to the duty. I had a case once where a, a, a woman told me, a wife told me, you know, my husband doesn't fulfill my rights. So 
The husband says, okay, what are these rights? She says, I need to be paid for all the breastfeeding. May Allah protect us. You know, I, I, I don't want to raise. Some people sometimes raise this and I think it's out of depression and, and sometimes out of trying to get back at someone. And you know, I need to be paid for this and that. And I don't, all the cooking I did and what he thought I was just a worker and a slave and so on. And I contacted brother, what have you done here? What is it? Why is she asking for all this? He says, no, I was talking to her and I told her, you know, I give you more than your due. And I said, why do you, why did you have to say that? For what? You need to understand that speak to the people lightly, speak to them, correct your spouse. If the hadith says tabassumuka fi wajhi akhika sadaqa, to smile at the face of your fellow Muslim brother is a charity. Don't you think it is a greater charity to smile at the face of your own spouse? Because Islam believes in the notion. Islam came with charity begins at home before English brought the saying along. Khayrukum khayrukum li ahli. The best from amongst you are those who are best in their homes with their wives and children, family members. Where did that come from? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They coined it beautifully in English saying charity begins at home. Mashallah. So some people misinterpret it. They take out $10 a day. That's my charity. Now I can go out. <laughs> Let us realize my beloved brothers and sisters that if we have happiness equal to the day we were married, we say Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And how can we achieve that? For a moment, let me explain to you. There is something known as khutbatul haja, which is normally read sometimes at the nikah. I'm sure it is the same here in Malaysia. So the Imam says, Ya ayyuhannasuttaqu rabbakum, O people, be conscious of your maker. Alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahidah, wa khalaqa minha zawjaha, wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisaa. O oh people, be conscious of your maker who has created you from one soul and who has created from that soul its spouse. And from the two of you, he has, create, he, he has caused mankind to spread on earth. And be conscious of Allah. So if we are conscious of our maker and conscious of the fact that Allah has created for us a spouse from us, and conscious of the fact that we have a duty towards our offspring so that mankind can spread in a dignified manner throughout the earth. And we look at the end of the verse, it says we should be conscious of Allah, the one whose name we use when we take an oath. When someone tells you something that is not so easily believed, Say, for example, they tell you, you know, I jumped three meters. You will say, you look at them and they say, Wallahi, I jumped three meters. Then you start thinking of a trampoline. You know? <laughs> because now they're telling you, because initially it made, they made like they just jumped three meters going up. Wow. Then you start thinking of something. Because why? They said, Wallahi. When you, they use the name of Allah, they took, take an oath with the name of Allah. It changes the whole flavor of that statement. So Allah says, be conscious of that Allah whose name you use and be conscious of the wombs that gave birth to you. And not only the wombs that gave birth to you, but the wombs that are used that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for you to have come into existence and for this progeny to continue. Be conscious. That's your mother. That is your spouse. That is your sister. That is your daughter. That is your aunt. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the true respect of our women. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide our women that they can live their lives in such a way that they earn the respect of those around them. I mean, you know, there are two sides of a coin. Uh, we cannot only say that may Allah grant respect to one side without the other. We, we need respect on both sides. So that is the first verse. Notice I am highlighting consciousness of Allah. If you are conscious of Allah, of your maker, and conscious of the fact that you are going to return to him, and she is conscious of the fact that she is going to return to the maker at all times. What will go wrong in your marriage? What will go wrong? You find there will be no flirting. There will be no uh, swearing. There will be no fighting. You know, we're fulfilling whatever we have to. And more than that, to the degree that the husband actually says, you know what? Sunday, just sleep. I will bring you breakfast in bed. Mashallah. Who says that's wrong? Is it wrong? Is it haram to do that? 
Some people say, no, I'm a Muslim. My wife must make that breakfast. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. We are not saying that this one or that one, but you want to enhance the love in the home. You might want to sometimes fulfill. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to help with the chores in the house. The messenger, peace be upon him, he assisted milking the goats as well. You know how tough that is? Allahu Akbar. I think we should go and try it. <laughs> and people are saying, no, this place is unclean. Look, you haven't hoovered the carpet. No problem. All you've got to do is pick up the hoover and say, no, don't worry, I'll show you how it's done. And show them how it's done. There was once a man who was, this is something that came to my mind because I said, I'll show you how it was done. It's not in the topic. There was a man who met me when I was in India and he told me, you know, I'm a revert. I was a Hindu and I've accepted Islam and I am now a Mu'addin. I call out the Adhan, but my Adhan is not so good. So the, the, the Mutwalli of the Masjid, you know, the person who, who is in charge of the Masjid, uh, he comes to me every time and says, you don't know Adhan. So I told, I said, who is he? So he pointed at a certain man. I said, but brother, do me a favor. In my mind, something crossed me and said, I don't think this brother knows how to do Adhan himself. And he's busy shouting someone else. So I told him, brother, next time he tells you, you don't know how to do Adhan, tell him that do me a favor. You show me how to do the Adhan. And however you do, I will repeat it. So what happened is this brother, he told the man that, you know what? Uh, okay, you are, you are telling me I don't know how to do Adhan. Please, can you just lead the way? Show me once. And I don't want to tell you how it ended. The man was so upset and he realized he didn't know and it took quite a while to solve that matter, but mashallah, it was solved. The point I'm making is, we need to lead by example. Sometimes we are complaining about dirt in the home. We are complaining that the food is not done properly, but we cannot even fry an egg to save our lives. <laughs> yes. And if they say, look, you're saying my food is bad. Okay, show me how to cook once and I will do exactly like that. Wallahi, you just have to say, oh, that was awesome, man. Awesome food. You know? So be reasonable, think what we are saying. There are some times in the home, and this is also one of the reasons why a home breaks, when we do not appreciate our spouse both ways. The man goes out to work, he wants to earn a living, he comes back, he is tired. Understand him, tell him, look, you know what? I really would like to talk to you and I really would like to spend more time with you, but I think you are very tired and so understand it. And this is not a green light to the men to say, you know what you heard today? We are tired when we come back from work, so don't talk to me. <laughs> don't let that happen. Appreciate that, look, the man has gone out and the man is trying his best. He is the one who has brought in the money that you are able to live in this posh house with. And you have such a vehicle and perhaps a driver and a cook and so on. And then when you have a meal that is made by your wife, remember sometimes it takes long. Some of us are fortunate to have cooks. You need to appreciate them too. But at the same time, in the most homes, the, the spouse cooks the meal. One small thing, we only pick on the negativity. You know, she might get a recipe from her friend. It took her one month to get the recipe. Emailing every, please send it. You know, women, I don't know if it's a problem in Malaysia, but they, they are normally very selfish with recipes sometimes. <laughs> they say, how was this pie made? They say, oh, you like it? That's my secret. <laughs> yes, they don't want to let others know. Wallahi, you, you take your secret to your grave. Is that okay? Give it to others. Wallah, I know in my own home when something is made, normally I am told, you know, this recipe is from that woman somewhere across the globe. And you say, mashallah. So don't worry, your copyrights will always be appreciated, inshallah, and acknowledged. So she has got the recipe after trying so hard. She came into the kitchen. And what did she do? She got the ingredients, she went to this shop, that shop, this place, that mall. She brought in all the baking items and came in, or the cooking items. And then she got, uh, uh, she perhaps might have bought a specific type of utensil that is needed or borrowed it or whatever. And a great effort and she has the meal and this man is busy at work. When he comes back, it is something that is presented and she is waiting to watch. What happens? When we come in, what's the smell here? <laughs> the same thing can be said in another way. What's the smell? You see the expression? How it changes the meaning? If I say, what's the smell? It means it's a stink. <laughs> and if I say, what's the smell? It means it's a scent. How you talk in the home will, will develop your home. It will protect it from breaking. It will protect it. How you speak, your expressions on your face, 
The Prophet وسلم, teaches that to us. The expression means so much. Because we spoke about the smile moments ago. Do you know what a smile does? The other day I saw a message on my phone saying, a smile is a curve that brings everything straight. So it's a curve that brings things straight. It might be correct. It's a curve. <laughs> we ask Allah to grant us goodness. These expressions, we are very fast. We are very, very fast when it comes to expressions of the face, on the face with outsiders. Come home and it changes. Look at yourself in the mirror. Have a little CCTV in the house by the door and see what you look like. Watch your own movie. Look at it. And then tell myself, why is my home breaking? Well, you know what? Just watch your movie. And then watch the real movie and see those who are not married, pretending to be husband and wife in a movie. What they do sometimes is, you know, far deeper than anything really married people have done. Allah protect us. Obviously, we're not, you know, encouraging people to go into the nakedness and so on. But what we are saying is we, we are all guilty of knowing the depth of, you know, the Hollywood and Bollywood and so on and what all that we have in the sense that even that which we ourselves are guilty of destroying within our homes we watch others mending and we don't even learn from that which is wrong Allahu Akbar I don't know if you understand what I'm saying <laughs> if we cannot learn from qala Allahu wa qala Rasul and we cannot learn from others who are enjoying a happy life then it's all over then it's finished because if you see others leading a happy life, you learn from them, number one. Then you will come to realize that, but the messenger, peace be upon him, has something more than that. I have explained in one of my talks that, you know, Aisha radiallahu anha describes how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was romantic in his home to the degree that he used to drink water from exactly the spot where she drank from and he would watch her to see that she is watching. Some of us are too big to do that in the home. I am too high in my business or in wherever or you know I'm too high in the religious rank to actually do that and when we go to the meat that was eaten once there is a narration which says that the Prophet وسلم, watched where she bit from this is his wife and he took it and rolled it to where she had bitten from and bit exactly where she bit from tell me what Valentine's Day can come up with <laughs> nothing that wife will melt, she'll faint, we need assistance. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. We'll need assistance. And that is something Islamic. We're talking of Islam. So if people say Islam and romance are two separate items, that's not true. Islam is a religion, but we are taught to be romantic with the right people. That's what we are saying. Today we can be romantic with all the others. Come home, everything is gone. This is the problem. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us when we begin to see how he lived, he, there was a time when he took his wife and they were at a specific place and he decided, look, I want to race with you. I want to see who's going to beat who here. And he raced with her the first time she won and the second time he won later on in life and so on. So these are the type of things that have been happening at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is according to his time. It was considered something very grand in his time. So sometimes with us, nowadays a little rose has a lot of value. What's wrong if a person who's a big businessman, you know, comes with a rose hidden behind his, uh, his back and he comes and suddenly presents it to a wife whom he's been married to for 30 years. Anything wrong? Islam doesn't say it's prohibited, especially if it's on an ordinary day of the year. No one will tell you anything. Or your wife might say, who gave that to you? It might happen. Yes. That might happen. Because she will probably be shocked. Allah protect us. It, we need to develop. It's not so difficult, but we are guilty of being, of drowning in our lives without looking at those who are the closest to us. Those who are the closest to us. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us so much, so much, yet we don't even know. Getting back to the verses that are read at the time of nikah, even the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqullaha. Oh, you who believe, be conscious of Allah. Be conscious of your maker. And this verse is repeated at the time of marriage. It's khutbatul haja. It is a khutbah that is often repeated for most important items. And the next verse, the last one, 
Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqu Allaha. It starts in the same way. Oh you who believe, be conscious of your maker at all times. Know that you are going to return to him. So in this you have someone whom you are married to. She is also the sister of someone. She is also the daughter of someone. She is also the relative of someone. She is very special and dear to her family members. And you need to know you have taken her into your custody, so to speak, or in your care, respect her and honor her and fulfill her rights. And where she is going wrong, there is a method of communicating with her, of letting her know. And that brings me to the last part of this third verse. Where Allah says, وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا sadida," Utter that which is upright. Utter that which is straight. Sadid means straight. Make sure that you are conscious of your maker and you only utter that which is upright. Because 90% of marital problems are connected to how you use your mouth. We have not been able to use it correctly. There is a drought when it comes to good words. And there is a flood when it comes to swear word. That's what's happening today. We have a drought of good words. And our mouths are flooding with bad words, swearing in the house, screaming, yelling. When you raise your voice in the home, your value is dropped forever. If you yell at your wife once in her face, sorry, I need to say it the other way around. If you yell at your husband once in his face, it's over. You know, we used to talk about wife bashing until I got so many emails saying, brother, we are bashed by our own wives. It's husband bashing now. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. So it's important for us to know either way, respect one another, understand one another, speak to one another in a beautiful manner. Make sure you know this tongue. You need to say words to your spouses and your children of reassurance. You love your child. Let him hear it every day. Every single day, the next time he wants to do something bad, he say, you know what? My dad really loves me and I don't want to let him down. I really don't want to. This is not worth it. Some fathers are still of the old school. You know, I really, my, with all respect to those who are older than me here. But some fathers are of the old school where they will never ever utter those words in their lives to their children. You say, my daughter, I love you. I really love you. You are the most special gem in my life. You know what it does to a daughter when you say that? It gives her the reassurance. It makes her feel the sense of belonging. It gives her so much to be happy about in life. It solves half of her problems in life just because she is hearing the reassuring words of her mother and father. And the same applies to the spouse. You know you love them. But you need to say it again and again. Like we got to the food moments ago. And you need to say this food is, mashallah, it's really, really great. Even if the salt is a little bit more. Because sometimes, as I was saying, she spends so much time bringing it in front of us. And we are worried about how it's smelling, number one. And number two is we say, as we taste it, the salt is too much, no? <laughs> salt is too much, no? What are you talking about? She just looks at you and her face flops. I've been at it for three hours here, four hours. I've been busy with this for so many months. And what is she going to say? Next time I'll try a bit better, a bit harder. That's if she's a good woman. If not, she'll say, never going to cook this again. <laughs> typical. Never gonna, it's typical. Never going to cook this again. And if you have someone who's very witty, the next time there's salt to be put in, I'll call you to put it. So we need to praise the cooking of our wives. We need to praise their, 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 their dress code, especially, for example, I can let you know something that has worked for some people. Where you find some women, you know, they don't like to dress appropriately. So the husband sometimes wants to tell them something. There are two, three ways of doing it. You can either say, this is very bad. I don't want you to wear this. And you know, you might have a response. But if you want a response from the heart, what you do is, you tell them, the other dress looked much better than this. You see, so you are praising one thing and that praise is not there when the other thing is there. So you have told them in a way that this is what I really love. And go beyond the limits in praise. That's your wife. Don't worry. You can say whatever you want to. Mashallah. In terms of goodness. Like the food. You, when you eat, even if it is a little bit this way, that way, just praise it. Mashallah. See what it is. 
Praise the effort at least. MashaAllah, you know. Let me tell you what has happened once. They say the Imam in the masjid said, in fact, two things have come to my mind. The Imam in the masjid said, you need to praise the cooking of your wife, just like I said now. So the man went home and he had this meal and he was looking at it and looking at his wife and smiling and all happy, mashallah, and excited and everything. And when he finished, he says, oh, it was awesome. And the wife says, what? I've been cooking for you for 21 years. You never said that. Today when the food came from the neighbor, you want to say it was awesome. So he says, oh, I'm sorry about that. I didn't know. <laughs> it's like the other one, the Imam, he, he was telling the people, you know, he gave them advice in the masjid about their wives that look, you need to do this and do that. So the man goes home very happy. He tells his wife, darling, I'd like to carry you today. Oh, wow. Oh, I hope I'm not too heavy, darling. You know? So anyway, he carries his wife, mashallah, and he's carrying. What makes you do this, my beloved? What's happening here? Oh, the Imam told us, go home and carry your burdens, mashallah. <laughs> you carry my burden, mashallah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. They told me to try the Malaysians out when it comes to humor. We have tried them and mashallah, it's quite true. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> mashallah. Barakallah fikum. So the points being raised here are, let us understand that this is something long term. We don't want to, really, we don't want to destroy our marriages because of little selfishness and because of a drought of statements. It is free to speak. You know, you might have a toll gate with automatic clicking of your ring gates as you pass. Mashallah, at least your roads are okay. But what about, do you need to be paid to utter? Some women would probably be ready to pay their husbands to say, I love you. Allahu Akbar. And I think vice versa as well. So let's not do that. So the point I'm making is, in order to protect the home from breaking, we need to utter certain words. We need to say things. We need to never underestimate the value of a beautiful statement to your wife and your children. Never. Now let's get to a home that sadly things have gone wrong within. I told you moments ago that when you are sitting and watching a nikah, seeing someone, one of the lessons you learn is to ask yourself, I was there. I was there. Why am I not as happy as I was that day? There are some who are even happier. For them we say, Noorun ala noor, mashallah. But there are some who are not as happy. Ask yourself every time you attend a nikah, what went wrong? Where did it go wrong? And let me try and look at where I went wrong. Don't just say, no, it was her. You know, she was like this. That's not good enough. Look at where you went wrong. Try and see how you can change. And if really there is something wrong with your spouse, you need to discuss it in a correct manner. You need to talk yourself. Yourself. You need to raise it respectfully. Don't bottle it in for many years and say, you know, for five years I've been bearing patience with you. And she said, well, if you had told me five years ago, I would have changed it. That's what sometimes happens. You're bottling in with your own spouse for what? Some women say that we have to do it because really this man is a lion. He might react in a different way. He might react in a different way. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has taught us that when there is a difficulty between husband and wife, they should communicate it out. They should sort it out between themselves. They should try their best to resolve the crisis. You know, before you go to bed, before you recline, you need to solve your matters. Have a big heart and become responsible people. Admit your guilt. That is some admitting the guilt. You don't have to confess to your spouse what you've done. But within yourself, admit your guilt and change it. If sometimes a spouse has to admit what they've done, I think, you know what, a lot of marriages would be broken. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected us from that. Ya man zahar al jamila wa satar al qabih. You know, one of the ways of calling out to Allah, O oh, you who has only shown that which is beautiful and hidden everything that is embarrassing and very ugly. Allah has hidden all that. And this is both physically as well as when it comes to our dealings and so on our words when you meet a man you don't know his 
You just know him for face value. You don't know how bad he is in the house and what he does when he, you know, swears his spouse. Some spouses will come and say, oh, this man really swears. And you say, who, him? But that man is in salah in the first saf five times a day. Yes, him. So you won't believe it. He is the one. But he, how? Allahu Akbar. So this is why we need to admit guilt. Admit it. Make sure that you know and change it within yourself. Say, no, she is right. I'm actually not being fair. You know, I'm on my phone all the time or I'm on the computer all the time. And this problem is both male and female, sometimes more with female as well. Every little thing. Tee -tee 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 -tee. And that's my sister, my someone. My Give it a bit of time. Your spouse is in the home. Put the phone on the fridge on silent. Switch it off and now deal with him. Mashallah. When he starts his Tee -tee 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 -tee, you can also then start yours and send him the message. We need to know this. A person who is in front of you live is far more important than someone who wants to barge into the discussion who doesn't even live near me. Far more important. We are taught that. So what about your own spouse, your own children? Gone are the days, or should I say, we should make the days go where we are so busy with our phones and our children are so busy on their computers doing all sorts of dirty items. Because we haven't even monitored. And when we monitor, we monitor with a stick. Gone are the days of the stick. It, it doesn't work anymore. What works is convincing. Speak to them. Engage them in discussion. In order to do that, you will need to apply your mind. In order to apply your mind, you need time and thinking and discussion with your spouse. Look, we, want, we have seen, for example, someone came to me and told me, I've seen my son watching pornogra pornographic sites on the net. What should I do? I need to tackle him. Should I kick him out of my home? I said, no, that's the biggest mistake you would be making. Your responsibility. Should I block the internet from the home? I said, he'll get it on his phone. So what do we do? I said, you need to engage him in discussion and show him what the evils of it are. Open up the discussion and explain to him what will happen. How you lose interest in the opposite sex. How you begin to disrespect your own spouse. A male who sits and watch that which is porn pornographic will automatically look at all women as sex tools and so on. There are so many things that happens. And explain to him that you know what, you're ruining your future. And engage him in discussion and tell him, Inshallah, I will speak to you tomorrow or next week. And let me know if, they, if, if you could not, if you succumb to this weakness within the week. And we will help you again. So now he'll be honest. And he'll come out. And you are helping him. You are assisting him. But if we want to pretend from the outside that this relation is so beautiful, son comes and sits in front of his dad every day, and you know, his mind is filthy, completely dirty, but you can't see it. May Allah protect our homes from that. The second stage, say for example, you have spoken to your spouse, you haven't solved the problem. We are, because it's now becoming a major problem. People don't want to admit their guilt, they don't want to change. And people don't want to cater for the other. Tolerance in marriage is very important. When you are a perfectionist, you put pressure on your marriage. Do not be a perfectionist when it comes to the inside of your home. And if you are a perfectionist outside, you tolerate things inside the home. Because once you have a child, you might have the child, you know, vomiting on the carpet. You cannot get angry. You might have the child urinate on your head. You can't get angry. That's your child. Sometimes it happens for... Allah to train you regarding your temper because what are you going to do? It's your own child. I have a brother of mine, mashallah, a real brother of mine. He was quite, you know, a temperamental person. He had one son, another son, and by the time he had a third child, all the temper was gone, mashallah. Now he's a cool, calm person, mashallah. Once in a while you find him losing his temper. He probably will see this disc a bit later. I'm worried about how to answer him. <laughs> But the point I'm making is valid that your children sometimes cool you down. They calm you down. They have to because they are your own children and they will do things. Don't get angry. Your spouse is only a human being. She cannot, you know, make sure that everything is 100% perfect. You know, you have sometimes a frame on the wall. You walk into the house and you say, you know what? That frame is not straight. Straighten it. Speak properly. Do me a favor. You get the measure tape. You measure around. You correct it. Show us how it's done. That's our rule. In an Islamic home, we have tolerance. We tolerate one another. We are different people. A man is brought up totally differently from his own wife in a different home. If you are brought up in the same home, you're probably not allowed to get married. <laughs> yes. 
And the woman gives up absolutely everything to come and live with the man. And next thing he wants to perfect everything. Even some women, they have this perfectionist idea. I'm not saying it is wrong to arrive at that level for yourself. That's not wrong. But to want that for everyone in a harsh manner is wrong. You break your marriage. Because nothing is going to be perfect. If the world was perfect today, we wouldn't even be sitting here. We wouldn't need to know why or how to help people whose marriages, you know, who have just been married or whose marriages might be suffering some turbulence in one way or another. Because there wouldn't be that turbulence. So when people become too rigid and so on in their own, and they, they, they cannot shift a little bit here and there, you find things breaking up and cracking. That brings me to a point. What about in deen? If a person is not reading their salah at all, my beloved brother and sister, one of two things. Either from the beginning you were reading your salah, both of you. In that case, you remind one another and you will appreciate the reminder of one another. If you suddenly decided right from today I'm reading my salah, show your spouse the same light that you saw. And in the same way it took you time to get to that, it might take her a little bit of time to get to that. And you can try and convince her, talk to her. I know it is something that is very important. Salah is a pillar of deen. But we are living in an environment that is not very Islamic sometimes. We are living in the midst of 40% non-Muslim. And we are living in an environment that not everyone reads their salah. So therefore, as much as I know that salah is without an excuse, must be read. But let's face the reality on the ground. There are Muslim homes where salah is not given importance. So in order to start that, you need to try and address the issue properly. You know, when we become holy in a, marital, in a marital home, after we are married, we cannot expect sometimes our spouse to follow suit immediately. They may do in most cases, but in some cases it might take a little bit of time. And if you are going to be agitated and so on, you might lose it altogether. So you have to tell them, look, at least read your Fajr, at least read your Dhuhr. And you started with one, with two, after a few months, inshallah, the five will have fallen into place. This is my way of looking at things and it has worked at times. There are two ways of solving the problem, either through willpower, you start immediately all your salah, that is ideal and that is the best way. That is the proper way. But sometimes it is better for a person to have read one than nothing, and two than one, and three than two, and so on. Because we look at it, if there are five salah, the minute you have read four, 80% of your problem is solved, you now have a 20% problem. And this is how we should be learning from one another. But believe me, since I'm speaking to both brothers and sisters, whenever there is an issue of religion, give in to it, adopt it, accept it. Understand that let us follow that which is better. Let us follow that which is higher when it comes to religion. And Allah will open your doors, one after the other. That which is higher. So if a person tells you, you know what, you're not dressing appropriately. You don't have to say, look, I was told by that sheikh that I can come slowly. <laughs> don't use that. That's not the excuse. That's never the excuse. But say... Okay, inshallah, I will do that and I'm not going to be embarrassed at what people think of me. The world can say what they want for as long as my maker loves me for that. The hadith says, Man arda Allah bi sakhatin nasi, radiya Allahu anhu wa arda anhu nas. Whoever pleases Allah and in the process receives or achieves the wrath of the people, Allah will love that person and very soon the people will also love that person. Whoever pleases the people and in the process displeases or angers the Almighty, the Almighty will be displeased with that person and very soon the people will also be displeased with that person. So you have to build your life. Today if people love you for the wrong things, one thing can happen in your life and they will still hate you. They will abandon you. But if people love you for the right things, you can't go wrong. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us develop. May He help us really within our homes. We have so many difficulties and issues. So when there is a difficulty, we haven't been able to solve it. The Quran speaks about al hakamain The Quran speaks about al hakamain before the hakamain, there is one way of resolving matters. 
A slight separation may help sometimes. You are within the same home, but you might want to think over your relation. And when we say a slight separation, we've got to look at who's wrong here. We've got to look at who's wrong and what the problem is and try and ponder over solutions. A lot of the times in separation, we mix with friends who tell us, yeah, fix him. Don't worry, just, you know, sort her out. Divorce her, come on, you can get this. No shortage of women. I was told that women here in M M M Malaysia are much more in number than the males. I can hear people saying five, six, I don't know what those figures are supposed to be standing for. But to be honest with you, whatever it is, it is very wrong to advise your friend to say, you know what, leave her, you'll get someone else. Someone might do that to you one day, then what will happen? Tell your spouse, leave him, get someone else. And you don't know it was a direct result of the wrong advice, the breaking of the home of someone else. In Islam, we do not break a home unless it's the last resort. We don't break a home. So in separation, mix with the right people. Your best friends are those who are hard on you. It's a fact. My beloved sisters, my beloved brothers, your best friends are those who can tell you as it is. They tell you what you do not want to hear. Those are your best friends. Listen, you know what? I think you're wrong. Come on. He's such a good man. You know, look at the positives of it. How could you walk out like this? And you're sitting with tears in your eyes saying, no, he's done this. Okay, we know what he's done. We'll talk to him. We'll explain to him. But don't know. Give him another chance. That's your friend. That person is genuine. They are thinking of you, your children. They are mature in their thinking. Not the modern Hollywood thinking where something small happens. One SMS on the phone. Divorce him. Go home. That's what's happening. If that was the case, it's so easy to break the marriage of a person. All you need to do is just send, I really love you more than she does, to, her, to his phone. And the marriage is over. She just has to see it. And let it beep at two in the morning, beep, beep, under the pillow. And while she's snoring, she picks it up. That moment, she's gone home already. When you get up, she has a note. It's like they say, the two of them who were not talking to one another. The husband had to leave following morning. And they, they, they weren't talking. So the husband writes a note for his wife on the dining room table saying, please get me up at five. I know we're not talking, but get me up at five o'clock. <laughs> Some of you know this already. <laughs> so the following morning, the man gets up at 10. He looks at his clock and he says, oh no. Anyway, after a while, he sees a note by his bedside saying, it's five o'clock. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Which means they were not talking to each other. She was there. She woke him up also with a note. So sometimes we wake up, we see a note, I'm gone. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. My beloved brothers and sisters, if even a little separation cannot help, we move to the next stage. Bring in someone respectable from your side, whom you trust and whom you will accept their solution. Our problem is we bring in a party from our side. She brings in a party from her side. The two of them get together. They meet us. They discuss the problem. They present the solution. And we say, no, I'm not ready for that. That's wrong. Islam has a different outlook. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, If the intention of both parties is to solve the problem, it will be solved. But if one of the parties is trying to prove that the other one was wrong, and this one is trying to prove that that one was wrong, you won't find a solution. No solution. Because the minute someone says, no, you know, you need to do this. No, he was wrong or she was wrong. I want her to admit her error and she was wrong. Is this, is this a meeting in order to prove who was right and wrong? If that's the case, we may not move forward. Put it back behind you and promise from today we are not going to do this and from today we are going to start a new leaf that is a way even with the maker with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we have engaged in sin we have to turn a new leaf allah does not remind us of the past every time and allah does not say remember that day you did this and that day it's wiped out it's gone it's finished you started a new leaf and a new life and it's over subhanallah that's the love of allah so within our homes we need to know that if you have had a problem in the past and you've solved it, don't raise it again. Don't raise it. People have the bad habit. Shaitan makes you say, but you know, from the very beginning you've been doing it, but I thought that problem was solved. And then it comes into a new problem. So the two parties that have come together, that you have appointed one, she has appointed one, and they discuss, you need to appoint people you respect, whose solution you will adopt. 
So when they come and say, look, we'd like you to give it another chance and we think, you know, you need to improve on X, Y, and Z and he needs to improve on A, B, and C and this is what needs to happen, you surrender to what they have decided because you both want to solve the matter. If after that you still find the problem reappears, comes back, and so on, and you find that now you are unable to resolve that matter, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has permitted divorce as a last resort. As a last resort. And to be honest, some cultures and religions do not allow it, whilst others take it for granted. Islam has a middle path, and Islam teaches you that it is not something you should be playing with, and it is not something that the Almighty loves, but as a solution, as a last resort in order to protect you and your sanity, we have allowed it to happen, and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has permitted it. So we have ways of resolving the matters and the problems. And these are some of the ways that I have mentioned this evening, how to resolve matters. We appoint parties, and even before that, we talk amongst ourselves. And I'd like to mention a point even before that. Introspection is important. What is the meaning of introspection? Look at your weakness. Ask yourself, what do I do? How can I improve myself? Let me tell you how people go wrong. Number one is time. We spoke about time. T-I-M-E. Time. Time is such that if you don't spend it with the right people at the right times, you may destroy a home. Some people don't have time for their wives. They're working every day, all day, morning to evening. Come weekends, I'm on shift. I'm on what? Weekend shift. I'm on call. What? That can happen once in a while, but not every day. You also need a break. Your wife also needs to, you, and your children also need you. You have another role to play as a father of the home or the mother of the home. The same applies to mothers. In some countries, you find children are astray, completely astray. Why? Mother is not there, father is not there. They have an au pair. They have a maid. They have a child minder who looks after the child. So you find that they accept the religion of the child minder. They speak the language of the child minder. They have the habits of the child minder. Their best friends are people who are, who are uh, similar to that child minder. And when they grow up, you, you are wondering, what's happened to my child? It's not your child. It's the adopted child of the child minder. And you gave them up for free adoption. You were just using the home as a dormitory. You just came in and walked out. No, that's not fair. You can have a child minder, but there are limits. You need to know, I need to work and I need to come home. So the issue of time is extremely important and quality time. You know, going out for a break, some of us, myself included, we are not very outdoor people. Not very outdoor people. If you had to invite me to a talk, I'd come faster than if you invited me to go and see animals. I'd rather see human beings, mashallah. <laughs> but sometimes you have to gulp it down for the sake of your family and children, you need to go. For the sake of your family and children, you need to have the outing. And you need to pretend like you enjoyed it. Allahu Akbar. You know what? You probably will enjoy it. Then we have another T. What is that T? The issue of trust. We said time, now we talk of trust. Some people, for every small thing, they don't trust their spouses. Every small thing. Remember, suspicion and doubt is a cancer that doesn't have a cure. Besides, the chemotherapy by the, own, by the person himself or herself. It's a cancer. It's a disease. If you are, if you are a suspicious person, you are sick. Don't suspect and don't want to know everything. Who was that? Why was that? Why did you say this? Why did, who did you talk to? What happened? Some men have complained to say, you know what? After I speak on the phone, I have a conference. Why did you say this? Oh, you know, three minutes into your discussion, I heard you say that. What did they say for you to say? Come on, man. Leave the man alone. Let him have his discussion. He's a good man. He looks after you and so on and so forth. You know, one or two little weaknesses you can discuss and so on. If something comes to the fore, yes, you discuss it. Don't go prying into someone's life for nothing. Give them a little bit of that trust that you have and allow it, allocate it. Sometimes, you know, you might misunderstand things within the home such that you will want to break a marriage and the man is innocent. And the same applies to the female. Sometimes she's innocent. And you know, we, we start doubting. No, I think this is going on. And we believe anonymous callers. 
This is something bad. Someone anonymously emails you, you know, I saw your wife do this, or I saw your husband do that. If they were brave enough and loved you, they would come with their name and face. But anonymous, someone calls you and says, you know, your husband has fathered a child with someone else. All they want is, I love him so much. He's such a good man. I don't know how to get him away from you. This is the only plan I thought of. I'm waiting for you to divorce him. So therefore, he has fathered a child somewhere else. And you go, in the home. Yes, very bad. I believe this and I'm going. And once you're out, she comes in and says, wow, I have had a case of a woman who confessed that to me. And she said, I'd like you to give many years ago. I'd like you to use this example. She flicked off. She flicked off the wife of a man who she wanted to marry and she married him and she was divorced as he found out what had happened because they were so happy until one day she said you know how you divorced your first wife how and she related the story and he immediately left her and he went away and by that time things too late there were cracks and breakages and to me i blame both parties the criminal was the one who invented the lie but the one who believed the lie was equally guilty allahu akbar why should we do that? When the Quran says, When someone comes to you with news, authenticate it thoroughly before you believe it. Because the mere fact that they are discussing someone else in your presence renders them sinful. Allahu Akbar. That's a different translation I've given you this evening. I actually, subhanallah, Normally we translate it by saying when a sinner comes to you with information, verify it. The reality is even when a, a person comes to you with information, the fact that he is now talking about someone else, it would render him a backbiter unless you have had four witnesses to it, which then renders them truthful people, especially when it is the discussion of immorality and when it is the discussion of adultery and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So trust is something important. We've spoken about time. We've spoken about trust and how valuable it is to trust one another. And we hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can grant us happy homes, help us to resolve our matters and problems. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all the smiles every time, not only here in Malaysia or in KL or in this venue, but in our homes with our children and with those whom we are the closest to. Really, it's about time we stood up and it's about time we were responsible and it's about time we realized the broader picture and it's about time we learned the beautiful religion we are following a lot of muslims do not know islam a lot of muslims do not know the solutions that islam has and yet the quran teaches us the sunnah teaches us the sharia that allah has revealed teaches us when it comes to certain laws, some people consider barbaric. Sometimes those are the only solutions for you in your problem. The only solutions. But when we don't want to adopt something, sometimes we find, you know, you have the separation and the segregation in the Sharia. You visit my home, mashallah, you are more than welcome. But there is a line, there is a limit, which you and I will not cross, which others might cross, but as Muslims we don't. You don't just sit and laugh and giggle with my wife up to two in the morning when I'm gone to sleep because even if the two people were good and innocent, shaitan is very bad. So someone says, no, they are responsible human beings. The sheikh told us to trust them. Allahu Akbar. Trust them. Do not give reason to someone to doubt you. That's also a qualifying statement. Whilst we are saying you must trust one another, do not give reason for them to doubt you. No, don't. So some people are guilty. They might say, look, you're supposed to trust and so on. And yet you find them when they go out, they are dressing so well with all their perfume and the wife is being left at home. Where are you going? If that question doesn't come about, I think she might not be a human being. It's normal to ask. But look, hey, I see you really taking so keen interest every day. You're dressing up and so on. And this is why in Islam, and this is for the sisters, a lot of us, men as well perhaps, we are guilty when we leave the home, we like to talk up. That's the word I use. You know, dress up well, leave the home. So all the men on the street, wow, look at that lady. You know. And when you come home, we are in our cooking clothes up to, two, up to two in the afternoon. Husband comes, 
I don't want to go back to that smell, but subhanallah, we have not even dressed to welcome him into the home. Yet, it is more important for a Muslim to dress in the most attractive way within the home than when they are leaving the home. Today, we are doing the opposite, guilty as charged. We're doing the opposite. Imagine every time your husband comes or say, you know, as a, as, as a husband, you go home and you are best dressed, looking prim, prom, prop and smart and mashallah, smelling so good. And you come in with that smile, the same smile. We're not asking you for a bigger one. The same smile you give the people at work. Come and try it at home. Its effects will be far greater, believe me. And they will be halal as well. Allahu <laughs> Akbar. So my beloved brothers and sisters, here we have a beautiful religion. The only thing I've done tonight reminding one another, myself to begin with, to say, we can achieve it. It's not impossible. We can. It's beautiful. But we need responsibility. And we need to protect ourselves from all the different magnets around us that are pulling us towards negativity by staying in the center and creating that positivity, being happy with what you have at home and being happy with your spouse and your children, spending time with them. The best feeling you could have is when your children race to you and hug you. Oh, dad, I missed you, you know. Subhanallah, mom, I really missed you and so on. What feeling would you like better than that in terms of the home environment? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our homes. On this occasion, we pray for those who are suffering turbulence. May this be, may this be a means of resolving your matters. And may this be, inshallah, an occasion where those who are suffering some form of turbulence can go back and look at their leaves, turn a new leaf and solve their problems. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding, the understanding of one another, the understanding of the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May He make us responsible people and may He give us every reason to smile. Until we meet again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, Johnny.